So uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit. This is kind of just inaugural, so this is going to be very high level. It's going to be kind of a, it's going to be more of a, of a maybes and don'ts kind of trade-off. Um, I don't even want to try and dis um, explain any of these AI systems in a half an hour. We'd get about halfway through, and then we'd be done. So that's not, not a conversation I wanted to have today. Um, but, uh, but I did want to kind of help level set some of the things that maybe an organization or an individual needs to consider if you're thinking about adopting AI or, or if you're uh, uh, making those motions already. Um, so first things first, um, I don't know about everyone else, I've been doing this for a while, right? Um, I've been a science fiction geek my entire life. I've uh, been a technology geek, a fair bit of that as well. Um, I've been hearing about AI being five to 10 years out pretty much since I was in grade school or junior high, right? So a few months ago, when the whole chat GPT thing started, my defenses were well up, right? My shields were up. Um, I, that was not getting through because I've heard this way too many times before in my life. So I kind of blew it off until I couldn't anymore because it became pretty obvious that this time they did it um, or they, they made some big changes. Um, now I don't feel bad about that because I don't know if, if it's, how many people know who Jeffrey Hinton is. Um, okay, so godfather of AI, just left Google. He's doing a bunch of interviews. He did stuff on CBS Morning. That's a great interview. He did an interview with the BBC, also worth watching. Jeffrey Hinton has been doing this his entire life. He's in his 70s, just retired. He was surprised, right? This, if this guy's surprised, nobody should feel bad about being surprised. Um, and then, you know, another thing that made me feel better is a venture capitalist who I have, um, a venture capitalist who, I, uh, who I've been to some of his conferences and who I follow um, online a little bit, he said he was worried about being too late to the AI thing and then he realized that no, he's not too late. None of us are too late because he said this is essentially the Netscape moment if you're talking about the internet and the World Wide Web, right? So if you think about the internet and the World Wide Web, that puts us at right around 1996. Right? And think of everything we've accomplished since then. So, no, we're just at the beginning. You're not too late. Like, the appropriate thing to do is maybe be a little bit more cautious than, than, than you know, anything else at this point. Um, and then the final thing is, you know, my big concern, at least over the last week or so of, of building this deck and, and doing a lot of reading, is uh, are, are we in the next dot com boom? Right? Late 90s, those of us, if you're if you're old enough to remember the late 90s, right? Huge build out, amazing, cool technology, excitement, exuberance, and probably too much. And we crashed and burned for a while, and then we actually figured out what we wanted to do with all this technology. Um, and so, you know, that's the big concern is, are we there? Now, maybe we are, maybe we're not, maybe we are learning the lessons this time, maybe we didn't. But that's something I've been thinking about. So the next thing I wanted to bring up was evolution or revolution, right? So, you know, we've got the keywords here. We've got the large language models. Um, we've got diffusion models. Large language models, right, is a chat GPT, the thing that's giving us text. Diffusion models are the things that are giving us the, the really cool pictures. Um, those are based on generative AI, which is based on neural networks. These are all really good talk ideas, and we should have them. Um, I'm not going to get too deep into that today. It's too much. Um, but an important thing to think about is why now? What happened that let all this happen in the last few months? And basically, we're at a really interesting inflection point. We arrived at this conjunction of computing power, right? Things we've been working on for 70 years of hardware development. Iterative research, about 70 years of AI research started around World War II, and big data sets. We finally accumulated massive amounts of data and we took this massive amount of data and we fed it through these models that were built out of this research and um, we applied the computing power that we developed to it and suddenly things magic happened and um, some of this is emergent like they're not they weren't really expecting the really great things they they got um, 
out of these neural networks just yet. It just kind of happened, and they were kind of surprised at some of the results. So some of that is emergent, um, which you expect in computer systems. If you've been around for a long time, you will see emergent behavior in, in computer systems and software, oftentimes unplanned for, and sometimes not easily explainable, which is often frustrating. Um, uh, all the big tech companies um, are, uh, are doing stuff right now, right? Uh, did anyone watch Google I.O. yet? I watched, I, it's on my list for this weekend. I was too busy to watch it yet. Apparently, you know, the word AI was like every sentence and, and they announced a ton of new products and all kinds of cool stuff. And, and you know, I'm gonna go watch it because it sounds pretty cool, but, um, but I, I haven't had a chance to watch that yet. All the big tech companies are releasing stuff. What's really been interesting is the open source community started getting a hold of these models. Like the Llama model escaped from Meta about a month ago, and the open source community has just grabbed a hold of that. And now instead of going from a few hundred or a few thousand researchers in big tech companies working on this stuff, we've got tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of open source developers all going crazy on these models. To the point which, who's familiar with the Google No Moat memo? Okay, go read the Google No Moat memo where this engineer, this AI researcher in Google basically says, um, we have no moat, OpenAI has no moat, open source now owns this, and we have to keep up with them. And it's mind blowing read, but if you, if you have any interest in AI, you need to read it because the genie's out of the bottle. And, um, and what's really cool is that means a lot of us here can do some really cool stuff with AI without necessarily leaning on the big tech companies although they are going to still provide the most powerful models. They just have the computing power and the resources. Um, so well, now we're going to finally get to AI adoption. We're going to cover a few simple things here. We're going to start with impacts, opportunities and risks, and then education, what you need to maybe, uh, what you need to understand maybe as an individual or as an organization to take on AI adoption. And that's, that, the education is something I've been spending some time on both for myself and for my organization. So first of all, I wanna focus on known impacts, right? We have a ton of speculation in the market. Frankly, it drives me insane. I have an engineering mindset, speculation. Um, I get into arguments with some of our own internal people all the time. Some of them are very close to AI, and I have incredible respect for what they're doing. But at the same time, I'm, uh, I'm a metrics-driven guy. Uh, speculation is not my thing. Two papers have come out recently um, that are, one is peer reviewed, one is not, and they point to what we are probably gonna see out of artificial intelligence, at least in the near term. The first one is from the National Bureau of Economic Research. It was published last month, and it's the first study on the impact of AI and machine learning on workers in an actual company. And it's a good paper, there's the link. Um, if you, want, if you uh, want to look it up, it's not a bad read. Although it's your typical peer-reviewed academic paper, it's a little heavy in places. The important things to remember is this is a customer service center. These are individuals who are supporting software. They are supporting software, I believe, out of the Philippines for an undisclosed company, probably an American company. And like all customer service centers, they have probably roughly the same turnover rate of around 60%, right? The work is brutal. It's hard, there's a language barrier. They're Filipino, which means they speak English, but it's not necessarily their first language. Um, and so uh, it, it, was, it was something that the, the company, the customer service company was very interested in trying out as a way to assist the people who were actually taking these calls. And what they discovered, spoiler alert, um, they discovered roughly a 14% productivity increase, mostly at the, uh, uh, not at the expert end, right, at the lower end, the people who had just, um, the newer employees or the employees who were not necessarily always the best performers, saw about a 14% productivity increase and an 8% decrease in turnover. When you're talking about 10 to $20,000 in replacement costs for every worker, um, huge. Uh, both those are huge. So. Um, I'm excited because a 14% increase in productivity um, is great for any company. Any company who can take on 14% increase in productivity, I mean, your bottom line is set for a while, that's for sure. 
um, and everyone does better. Uh, the next paper was a working paper. This just came out um, uh, from MIT. Um, I can get the link. I don't have it up here because it's kind of long and obnoxious, but I can share that out later. Um, this was experimental evidence of the productivity effects of general artificial intelligence at MIT. And what they basically discovered is AI, let's, let AI systems restructure the work, right? And you spend less time staring at a blank screen or a blank piece of paper trying to get started, and you spend a lot more time with idea generation and editing. It just gets you past the drudge work. And so, again, it's a productivity increase. It, and, and, and overall satisfaction on the work goes up dramatically for people who were in this, in this uh, um, study. Now, again, this one's not peer-reviewed yet. It's a working paper. We'll see what, we'll see what eventually happens. Um, another known impact. Um, these are obvious to anyone who's reading headlines, right? We have all kinds of new jobs. You can, you're a prompt engineer, right? Um, you can make a lot of money as a prompt engineer, which actually makes a lot of sense. These systems are only kind of good at understanding what we want. So essentially, it's like a programming language. So the people who are doing the prompt engineering have basically taught themselves a new programming language, and that's what they're doing. Um, will that stay as a job? I don't know. Um, I have my own pet theories, and, and I'd be happy to hear other people's as well. I suspect the interfaces are going to get better, and I suspect the, um, that at some point, um, prompt engineering will not be, you won't, you won't be able to make a quarter of a million dollars a year as a prompt engineer like some people claim you can do now. Um, another thing you're going to see a lot of is you see a lot of openings for AI ethicists and auditors, right? If you don't properly train these models, they have bias. And a biased model is not as helpful as an unbiased model. And so we don't have enough ethicists and auditors in the AI sphere, so you're going to see a lot of openings for those types of people. It's, um, it's, a, it's somewhat specialized work. AI trainers, training an AI model in the right way, also somewhat specialized work, don't have nearly enough of those, right? All the big companies have those people. If you want to stand up a specialized model, for a specialized case at your company, you're going to need to find a, a trainer somewhere to help you uh, uh, do that properly. Um, you're going to now the next ones are my a little bit more my speculation, but um, you're going I think you're going to see additional specializations, right? Any agile teams, any any uh, any software development teams, you're going to have um, you're going to need your product owners, your developers, your quality assurance people, um, to a certain extent, your management team, your executive team are all going to have to have some knowledge of AI if you're going to incorporate it in your company. And we'll get a little bit more into that in a little bit, but um, that's just an impact, right? You cannot bring something in-house, you cannot bring a new technology in, airdrop it into your, into your company, and magic going to happen and suddenly you're going to be making millions of dollars. It, it, there's a level of effort involved. Um, the next thing, of course, and then the final thing that, I, that is just mind-blowing, and these numbers are probably out of date. Like, I pulled these numbers last week. They're probably wrong. Y Combinator 2023 Class 1 had 183 companies in it. 51 are AI startups. $1.7 billion, according to PitchBook, has been committed in quarter one 2023 for AI companies, and there is $10.7 billion pending. Um, Sequoia uh, Capital had a whole thing, which is a great read, by the way, um, about, about a, how they see AI, how they see the marketplace, how they see uh, the startup ecosystem for AI. And at the very bottom in fine print, it basically says, hey, if you have a startup idea, call us. <laughs> it's basically a big, giant advertisement, but it's still a good read. Speculated impacts. Everyone says jobs are going to go away. OK, I've been in this industry for 30 years. It, we, we have been increasing specialization every few years for 30 years. I started writing C uh, code on Unix systems in 1994. I could still be writing C code on Unix systems today, right? The market just grows. I wouldn't be doing it in Omaha. I'd probably be doing it in Seattle or someplace like that. But the market just grows. I'm not sure how many jobs are going to be eliminated. Some might be. But I'm not willing to take any bets on people being unemployed anytime soon because of an AI system. Will companies be eliminated? 
Well, okay, who knows what Chegg is? Right? Homework cheating company, some people call it. Homework assistant company, some people call it. I don't know what you want to call it. Did anyone see what happened to their stock price last week? Dropped by 50% because they basically said they're not sure how they're going to deal with AI. Ooh. Um, companies may, who don't know how to pivot, are in trouble. Um, does anyone know who Upstart Holdings is? Okay, Upstart Holdings is an AI-based loan company, essentially, right? They're going to use artificial intelligence to do loans better. Their stock price is up like 50% in two days because they had their quarterly earnings statement uh, a couple days ago. And yeah, I'm not, well, nobody's sure if it's, if because their financials weren't great, but they do have AI in there. And so maybe the algorithmic trading pushed it up. But yeah, Upstart Holdings is huge. A lot of C3.ai has, has seen a, a boost. Um, again, don't know what's causing this, but there's some exuberance out there. Um, so some companies are gonna be in trouble, some companies are gonna do really well. And then of course, as I brought up earlier, we could have a bubble, we don't know. Um, but my main takeaway is be careful of the hype. We just don't know what's gonna happen. Okay, opportunities and risks. So if you are looking at bringing artificial intelligence into your company or using artificial intelligence in your organization, you need to be careful about intellectual property, right? Now, the great thing about AI is that it looks like we're gonna get increased cre creativity, we're gonna get increased productivity, and we're gonna get innovative insights and analysis, which is potentially intellectual property that we are creating for our organizations, things that we can uh, acquire and essentially own and benefit from. However, these AI systems are trained on existing intellectual property. There are numerous lawsuits that have been filed against, Chad, against OpenAI and other companies because of this. If you are using OpenAI or any of these other companies, you need to be careful because you are potentially exposing yourself to other people's intellectual property and the risks thereof. You should also never, you need to understand how these things work, right? So they were trained on a bunch of intellectual property and they're continuously trained on data that is fed to them. So don't be like the people at Samsung last month who copied and pasted a bunch of source code into ChatGPT and said, please review our source code because now Samsung's proprietary source code is permanently embedded in ChatGPT and you can't get it out again. There's no way to remove it. Samsung currently has a policy that is uh, they're not allowed to even use ChatGPT in the company right now because they're trying to figure out how to solve this problem. So never put IP, uh, company IP or PII data into one of these systems. If you need to do stuff with either one of those things, all of these companies will gladly sell you an isolated instance, your own instance. And you can feed as much data into that as you want to because nobody else but you can get to it. It's like, it's like doing anything on the cloud, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't pick some random database in the cloud and start putting your data into it. You'd want your own in your own VPC. Um, theoretically, uh, this, the, the, these next two things both come from Steve Leto, who's a lawyer on YouTube. Um, theoretically, you could get someone else's IP back out of it. So if ChatGPT is trained on a book and you ask uh, a biography, for instance, and I'm just gonna steal Leto's example, and you ask for um, biographical information, it could theoretically regurgitate that parts of that book verbatim. Theoretically. Very small percent chance because of how these things work, but it's theoretically possible. It's your responsibility to make sure that you are not distributing somebody else's copyrighted material because and Lido's video is pretty good because he goes through the terms of service for OpenAI. Basically, OpenAI is not responsible if you do that. It's on you, and not only um, will they not help you in court, but if they get sued at the same time, you've essentially agreed to indemnify them, which means you're gonna pay for their legal services. So do not trust anything that comes out of these systems. You have to validate them. Um, before you publish them on your own. The risks are not necessarily high, but they're not zero. Um, again, these are things that you need to be aware of if you want to bring these in as part of an AI adoption strategy. Um, another thing is, uh, so the next one is trust, right? So right now we're in this weird trust, do we trust AI, not trust AI thing. Has anyone gotten, um, yeah, I love this slide. 
<laughs> it has two heads and three legs. <laughs> so, sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes stable diffusion gives you exactly what you need, whether you want it or not. Um, who's played around with these things and gotten hallucinations out of it, like this, right? Like I said, show me a horse. That's not a horse. Um, so, yeah, and you can get chat GPT to hallucinate as well. You can get it to make things up if you push it hard enough. Um, so an important thing to understand is these systems are good at what they're trained on. So they're trained on mostly text or pictures um, on the internet. Um, and so they're like somebody who's read a lot of books, a lot, a lot of books, like every book in the library. But when you so like that person, so if I was just, so let's say you've read a million books and I say, I have a question for you, but you can't go to the library, you can't get to your computer, sit down in that chair, put your hands in your lap and answer these questions. And I get really specific. I say, um, uh, I give you a quote and I say, who said it? You have to answer, but, um, but I'm not gonna let you look it up, right? After a while, most people, if they couldn't remember, they'd him and haw, and then they might just throw out a random guess, right? We see that all the time on game shows and stuff like that. That's kind of what these, some of these systems will do. After they'll, They will literally, because they can't check. Now, that's changing. There's a version of ChatGPT that can actually go out to the internet and verify stuff. I think they added that, that, those hooks, but that's brand new. But most of the time, they can't do that. So they are literally sometimes just making stuff up because they don't have a choice. They're prog they're, they're, they are required to tell you something. It's in their programming, and, but they're not necessarily required to tell you exactly what you're asking for if they, if they don't have it. And there's, and again, they're not, they're not, it's not like a search engine. It's a little bit different technology. Again, good talk, somebody should do it. We'll figure that out as we go forward. Um, Another, a really good analogy I, I saw was um, they're also, because they're only good at what they've been designed to do and what they have been trained on, they're not general purpose intelligences, right? Like uh, those of you who have learned to drive or those of you who have taught someone to drive know that you can take a set of car keys, you can hand them to somebody who's about 15 or 16 years old, you can get them about, 50, about 20 to 25 hours worth of training and they can drive. You can never get ChatGPT to drive. And as Elon Musk has proven, you can spend millions of hours trying to train a car to drive, and it's only about 90% as good as a 15-year-old human. So some things are still really hard, and some things are just completely out of reach depending on the model that you're using. So we're, we're back to my favorite thing, which is hype versus knowledge. Understand the hype, educate yourself, so you know the limitations, so you don't do things like, like uh, uh, cause trust issues for your organization internally or externally. Um, AI is a force multiplier. Uh, I did a lot of time, I did a lot, worked a lot of time in the um, defense industry. Uh, force multipliers are a big thing. Um, AI is gonna be very powerful in that regard. It's gonna, what's gonna may help us with our productivity but, um, uh, and, and, and with, with our ability to uh, do all kinds of cool stuff, but there's also gonna be some problems out of it. Your social networks, right? We're probably gonna uh, see some really interesting things in your social networks where the social network can maybe intera start interacting with you. Um, uh, at the same time, um, Elon Musk's bot problem just got about two orders of magnitude bigger than it used to be. Good luck with that, Mr. Musk. Um, information warfare, we should probably, Hopefully the social networks will leverage some of these new AI technologies to do a better job of identifying malicious posts and stuff like that. Um, the flip side is it's gonna be too cheap to, for, for anyone to not do it, right? Any, it, information warfare is now within the reach of any country in the world um, or any company that feels like being malicious. Uh, I'm not looking forward to the next uh, election cycle. It's gonna be bad. Um, uh, generated images and deep fakes are super easy to do now. This is crazy stuff, um, which is cool. Uh, one of our guys just built a slide deck using, um, he did not use stable diffusion. He used mid journey. 
and he created a whole set of synthetic people that, uh, and I have to have him show me how to do this. It's like the same people on every slide, but Midjourney lets him pose them and, and put them in interactive situations with each other and stuff like that. And so there's a conversation across his slides and it's the same people. And I'm like, well, where'd you get the stock stuff? And he goes, I didn't, this is Midjourney. He just created it. Like it's, they're deep fakes. They look like people. Um, and so that was very powerful for him. Uh, it made it really easy for him to put a slide deck together. There's some really cool stuff you can do there. At the same time, the scams are gonna be off the hook. Uh, have you seen, the one that scares me the most as a father is um, there's a thing where if they can get a few minutes of somebody's voice, they can simulate it. Uh, there's already been one fake ransom call. Um, if you have children, I would suggest, or family members, I would suggest coming up with a code word some way to identify someone because you're not gonna be able to do it by voice. You can't tell the difference. It's, I hate to be paranoid and scary, but I'm a dad, um, I'm worried about it. Uh, legal defense, Elon Musk's team just used this, right? They just tried to use this, the judge threw it out. This was like literally a couple days ago. Um, uh, it's one of these cases that Musk is involved in. They showed some video of him at trial. His legal team said, well, because of deep fakes, you can't prove that was Elon. It might, have been, it might have been a deep fake. And the judge said, shut up. I'm not buying it. But he's not the first person to use that. That, that defense is going to become a thing. Um, so we have all these great opportunities. We have some potential risks, largely based on self making sure that we know what we're doing and self-educating. So how much learning? So, this is from the Landing AI Transformation Playbook by Andrew Ng, who started like half a dozen companies, Coursera, he used to be at Stanford. He's written a bunch of, he worked at Google in the DeepMind project, really smart guy. Um, his courses are, uh, I like his courses, I've taken a couple of the small ones. Um, what he recommends is executives and senior leadership get about four hours of training. If you're an, ex if you're an executive, if you're on a leadership team at a company, you should know enough about the technology and the models to have a good conversation about it. Um, and to make, and make sure that, that you are providing appropriate levels of guidance down, uh, down through the company. If you are leaders of divisions with AI projects, you probably need around 12 hours. You, not only do you need to know the buzzwords and the general constructs, you need to have a fairly decent idea how these things work. Some of the gotchas we just talked about. I added the third category because I think that's something that Mr. Ng missed out on, Dr. Ng missed out on, which is product managers, product owners, agile coaches, QA, et cetera, 12 to 20 hours, right? These are the people who are working directly with the development team. If you can't, as all things in software, if you can't talk to the development team at close to their level, you're probably in trouble. So I saw this as an oversight. I added my own group. I think it's 12 to 20 hours should probably know at least as much as the division leaders and probably a little bit more. He recommends your AI engineer trainees have about 100 hours. Um, that's basically a boot camp um, or, or some online courses. And we'll get into where you look at those next. So uh, there we go. Um, I've subscribed to a few newsletters. There's a bunch out there. These are my favorites. Uh, the algorithm from MIT Technology Review Hard to argue with MIT. Um, the batch at deeplearning.ai, there's Andrew Ng again. Um, Mark Tech Post is very technical. Um, so if you're looking for more of the, the, the development side, um, it's a pretty good website. I get tired of looking at it every day, so I subscribe to the newsletter so I don't have to. IBM has just launched a whole set of YouTube videos. They also did their new Watson X set of releases. Um, so it's worth maybe subscribing to their YouTube channel because uh, they are putting out some good, good short form content, right? You're not, you're not gonna be sitting there for half an hour. They're usually four to 10 minutes. Um, everyone and everywhere is offering courses right now. Um, I'm sorry, I've looked at a bunch of them for my company. Uh, I've lost track. Um, find something you like and see if it works for you. Uh, I like the stuff in Coursera. That's probably the stuff I'm going to be doing. By the way, if anyone wants to do a study group, I'm thinking the Coursera stuff for me personally because the price point is good. Um, the edX stuff is a little bit more expensive. It's because it's usually tied into MIT. So budget has something to do with that. Um, but um, 
But again, find what works for you. There's a bunch of free stuff on YouTube, of course. Um, and then all the universities, MIT, Stanford, Duke, Caltech, they offer all kinds of stuff. Duke has a AI for product owners short course. So if you are a product owner, um, that might be a good course. Uh, Caltech has a bunch of stuff. Stanford and MIT both have technical out of CSAIL, which is their AI group, and stuff out of Sloan, School of Management. It's MIT, so it's not cheap. Um, I'm gonna maybe level up to the MIT stuff if I feel like I need it. I think the Sloan stuff starts at like three grand and the CSAIL stuff starts at like 14. But it's MIT. I mean, everyone kind of expects that. Um, they all look really uh, attractive and well done. If you just want to play, a very short list, because there's a hundred sites out there right now. Um, Hugging Face is kind of an AI playground. Um, it's a startup. They're do, they put out, they just publish models, and people can mod them, can modify the models and republish them. And you can go in there and play with the models, and they've got all kinds of connectors and things you can do. Um, OpenAI has a playground. Um, NVIDIA has a playground. Assembly AI is another startup. They're kind of competing with Hugging Face, though with a slightly different direction, also a playground. Um, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, of course, all have products and playgrounds, and I'm sure if you are a startup or um, you, you already have a relationship with one of those companies, I'm sure you can get free credits. Um, so you just have to look and see what's out there. Um, I know Meta is doing a bunch of stuff, but I haven't seen them publish a playground. I don't know if they're gonna, because they're, they're not really a cloud service provider, but they do have some offerings. I just haven't looked to see. Um, so that's everything I had planned to talk about, right? So um, Ryan kind of gave us the initial picture uh, for the team, for the group. I just riffed on it for the slides. Thanks, Ryan, I, otherwise I wouldn't have probably uh, I would have struggled with a bit of a theme there. Pam organized the group. Thanks, Pam. Um, I'm glad somebody stepped up. I was thinking about it, but you, you got to it first, and that's fantastic. All images are from Stable Diffusion, which has made this the best slide presentation I've ever put together because I hate looking for stock photos. <laughs> I didn't have to look for anything. I just had to ask. Um, so uh, we're going to kind of pivot over to facilitation, but um, if we have any quick questions,